Welcome to the Spectators Alternative Conference, streaming live on Spectator TV. My name is Matthew Kilcoyne, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Adam Smith Institute. I'm privileged to be joined this morning for a debate about Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, a new union, by the leader of the official opposition of Canada, Aaron O'Toole. It's very early where you are, Aaron, so at just after six in the morning, so thank you enormously for joining us. Aaron has been the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada since August of this year and was served as Minister of Veterans Affairs in 2015 and has been a member of the Parliament for Durham since 2012. Aaron made Kanzuk a key plank of his offer to the Conservative Party members in the leadership election this year. Also joining us are Alicia Kearns, the Conservative MP for Rutland and Melton, elected in December of last year and who is the Deputy Chair of the APPG on Kanzuk. And finally, we're joined in what is the evening for him by Senator James Patterson, an Australian Senator representing the state of Victoria. Senator Patterson is the Chair of both the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Financial Services and the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, which is a hell of a, hell of a mouthful for spending a lot of money, uh, and Deputy Chair of the Select Committee on COVID-19, an important man. So he was also the only federal politician in Australia to publicly support Brexit prior to the 2016 referendum. And he's the author of A Ripper Deal, The Case for Free Trade and Free Movement, between Australia and the United Kingdom, which we released by, at the Adam Smith Institute earlier this year as well. Now, Kanzuk has been long known as an acronym in international circles and at the United Nations, where the Canadian, Australia, New Zealand, and UK governments have acted in tandem on issues for decades and together make up the non-US section of the Five Eyes Intelligence and Security Sharing Community. However, movements have recently set up in each state at the civil society level to push for greater freedoms for the citizens of each to live and work between the other states. They argue that Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK each share the same language, the same Westminster parliamentary system, the same respect for common law, and the same sovereign. The four modern states are liberal, diverse, mature democracies that trust one another, and whose citizens are well integrated and feel at home in each. So is it time to update the rights of citizens to mass match the aspirations? and the comfort of what is a proposition whose time has come, or is it something that's looking into the past? And so what I will do is I'll, I'll set up as, a, as we look to uh, Britain leaving the European Union and finally at the end of this year, and also looking at what the relations of this whole country should be in a, an ever regionalizing world, I'll ask Aaron O'Toole to set out why he made it such a key pillar of his campaign to members of the Conservative Party of Canada earlier this year. Over to you, Aaron. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Matt. It's a pleasure for me to join here early in the morning from Canada. And uh, the very fact that we have James uh, in Australia in the evening, Alicia and yourself in the UK, and myself here, uh, talking about Kanzuk, talking about a modern version of the Anglosphere reminds me of the old expression, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And it feels like that with the participation we have with uh, everyone on here tonight. And look, I, uh, I've been talking about Kanzuk for over three years now. Uh, like many good Tory leaders, I didn't win the first time I ran for the leadership of the Tory party here in Canada. I placed third out of 15 or so characters uh, in the last race. And really the, the policy that resonated the most from my campaign three years ago was Kanzuk. And it grew mainly out of um, conversations I'd had here in, in Canada, sparked by the Brexit debate in, uh, in the UK. And Canada had just finalized under Prime Minister Harper, a European free trade agreement between Canada and the EU. And there were already discussions here in Canada about what we would do post-Brexit uh, to ensure that our closest relation uh, out of the previous deal with CETA, what would we do with the UK in the, in, the, in the event that the Brexit vote happened? We had the CETA agreement, but we didn't have a standalone UK agreement. And what was remarkable at the time for me was there was a young expat Brit living in Vancouver of all places, James Skinner, who had started an online movement called Kanzuk International. And so when I was in Vancouver, James and I sat down and it was remarkable to see how much grassroots interest amongst all the countries there was for a, 
an update to the Anglosphere or an update to the Commonwealth 2.0 in the in the era of Brexit and in the era where I like to say we need aspirational multilateralism where we have uh, closely aligned countries that share like values share a, a history, a language, a commitment to the rule of law and parliamentary democracy to do more together uh, at a time where many people are seeing uh, international multilateral work becoming a race to the bottom at some of the international fora. So the, the concept of a Kanzuk, which has been out there for, for decades in various forms, was very appealing, particularly to young people where there's the ability to, to live, work, have the free exchange of people, capital, ideas, and to show that multilateralism can be a force for good when it comes to security and, and opportunity for the peoples of Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and Canada. I used to say it's, it's, it's four of the five eyes, which is our closest alignment of intelligence sharing and, and security cooperation. So um, I've been talking about it for many years, and when I ran for leader again, it of course became centerpiece to my to my policy campaign and i really think right now canada's at a disadvantage with prime minister trudeau because these conversations in various forms are happening um, post brexit with australia and new zealand and sadly under our current prime minister canada's not at the table whatsoever so if if Canada will be, we're in a minority parliament here in Canada, we will have an election probably sometime in the next six months. Uh, our party, the Tory party in Canada is pledging uh, to be a participant in a, in a Kanzuk type agreement between the countries. It will be centerpiece in terms of our platform. And I'm certainly optimistic that we have a very good chance of winning the next election and then joining our, our allies in discussions about really taking this relationship to the next level at a time where I think it's it's desperately needed. So there's a lot of interest here in Canada and that's why I'm up at the crack of dawn to talk about it today. And thank you very much for doing that. And I I, I know that actually it, it's an official plank of your campaign and, and, and uh, thank you for also bringing up uh, you know the, the current prime minister and whether he's actually doing enough. It's also an official policy of the nationals in uh, New Zealand and, act uh, as well in New Zealand. So it's becoming a bit more of the scene out there. Um, Alicia, in the UK Conservative Party, um, it's been an issue that's been growing and growing. The recent APBG, is just, mm -hmm. the backbench group on this has just been set up. How likely is this an idea that could be taken up by the leadership uh, at the UK Conservative Party? I mean, this is an idea that has to be taken up by the leadership. And I'm all to creating that future alliance that Aaron set out so beautifully. Um, you know, there is real passion for this within the party. There's real passion for it within the country. You know, the Adam Smith Institute has done research on this. It shows that to be the case. And it's really interesting because the only antis I hear, the only apologists, are essentially UK Labour Party MPs who suggest it's some kind of neo-colonial white nationalist project, which is just so completely offensive in every single way. You know, we are countries that embrace diversity and multiculturalism. You know, look at the EU project, that's made up of 27 mainly white countries, no one would ever suggest such a thing. And so I'm really keen that we are robust on this and step forward and say, this is a really fascinating time of opportunity for our nation. We need to step up, we need to embrace it, we need to cast off the shackles of people who are trying to make us apologists for the friends that we keep. Um, and we do have an incredible affinity. You know, I don't think there's any nations in the world that have the affinity that the Kansas ones do. And as Erin said, in, in a time where you know, we need to stand strong for our values and the international rule of law, it's really important that Kansas exists, not only so that UK can take its place in the world stage as an independent nation, but so that Western liberal nations can fight together, stand together in trade, diplomatically, in military circles, and stand strong for what we believe in. And we all recognise that this is a time where we are under a threat from hybrid warfare. And actually, Kansas can work together on science, on space, on education. There are so many things that we already do work together. You know, it's Australia that all my friends who are experts in space are going over to Perth to work on. You know, we need to make the most. You know, when I was, uh, when I was working in the military in the Global Coalition Against Daesh, which of course all Kansas members are, Whenever I was in a military base anywhere in the world, 
it was the candidate colleagues that came together not just for socializing but actually for working together because we have a natural affinity the same values the same kind of priorities and why would you throw away such an affinity and i think that's the recognition that's coming together in the conservative party as we start to stand strong and say we have a new future we have a new opportunity and Kansak absolutely has to be a central tenant of that thank you very much james the we've got bojo in number 10 we've got scomo in camera camera they ran on very similar electoral platforms they're very similar in terms of outlook on what life can mean have we got an opportunity with the fta is it being taken advantage of well enough by the two governments with so close affinities um, to deliver the promise of kansak to, that people want both in australia and the uk Thanks, Matt. And can I just say at the outset what a pleasure it is to be on a panel with Alicia and with uh, Erin. They're two parliamentarians who I admire greatly for their advocacy, not just of this issue, but actually a concern that the three of us share very closely as well, which is the Chinese Communist Party. And we could just as easily be on a panel uh, with the uh, three of us talking about that as well. And although it's not the topic of, of today's discussion, I think it's an underlying factor which is contributing to the resurgence of this idea and the popularity of this idea. I'm a free trader. I want Australia to trade with every country in the world, but I want our economic relationships to be particularly close with our long-standing trusted friends and allies, with people who we share values with, with people who we would never fear they would use our trade against us, who'd never engage in economic coercion against us, which unfortunately the Chinese Communist Party is doing. And in an age of rising authoritarianism, then finding like-minded allies, but binding together and working together is a sensible thing to do. What I think some people don't appreciate is that the building blocks are really there for a Kanzuk agreement. Australia already effectively has a Kanzuk agreement just with New Zealand. We have complete freedom of movement of people uh, and of trade uh, and capital. There's no uh, barriers between us. The World Trade Organization has called that trade agreement the best trade agreement in the world. Both New Zealand and Australia are right now negotiating free trade agreements with the UK. Uh, all we need to do is add Canada to, to that and effectively the building blocks are there. And it wouldn't take much effort at all to link those four trade agreements up uh, between each country and call it Kansas and have that agreement. So we're closer than we've ever been. We know it's now possible because of Brexit. The challenge is to seize the opportunity. Uh, I think there's real growing uh, groundswell of support for it here in Australia. As Erin said, it's particularly exciting for young people who want to have those opportunities to travel and study and work in like-minded countries with the same language and legal system and political culture. Uh, the challenge is just to seize that opportunity and I think we're very, very close. Erin, how do you think that the Kansas state should try and respond to, to China as a, as a threat? Well, great point. And uh, it's my pleasure to share the stage with, with like-minded uh, friends. And I will just build on one of James' points. It is very easy if there would be some leadership on the Canadian front, because Australia, New Zealand, Canada uh, were part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks together in terms of trade and uh, and uh, the while the US withdrew, the rest of us had been at the table. And of course, the relationships between Australia, New Zealand and Canada within that larger block of trade discussions were, were very strong, even though we had some issues like milk and other dairy products uh, as, as rubs, the, the relations were always strong. Going on to, to China, uh, I think this is another reason for it. I agree with James, this is, part of an underlying wider interest in Kanzuk at this time because of the global disruption caused by the Communist Party of China and how they have used trade um, in, in a predatory fashion. And it, it has been interesting for Canada to watch the, the leadership of Australia, to be honest with you, in terms of being an immediate sphere of influence and being much more straight up with respect to concerns about Beijing. Um, uh, all the countries have deep concerns with what's happening in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Canada in World War II, we lost, uh, lost our, our sons there trying to defend uh, Hong Kong. We had two battalions that tried desperately to fend off the Japanese. So we all have deep personal ties. There's 300,000 Canadian citizens who live in Hong Kong. There's more, we call it our 10th province. There's more 
uh, Canadians living in Hong Kong than in our small province of Prince Edward Island, for example. So I, I think that Prime Minister Trudeau has been remarkably mute on this subject. And I think Australia in, in some ways has been the, the, at the forefront of the Kanzuk countries in terms of pushing for a stronger international response. And I think it's having an effect. I remember even conversations between Alicia and I with respect to Huawei, I think the, the Five Eyes and the Kanzuk should have taken a united position on the participation of Huawei in our 5G critical infrastructure networks. And uh, I really do think that the positions taken by, by Australia and New Zealand eventually influenced the UK's decision, uh, along with the backbench, I, I think, uh, influencing the decision. Canada, of course, is still sitting out there having not made a decision. So I think with China's, uh, China's tradition of trying to isolate countries and apply pressure through the, the size of their economic uh, clout, the more we have this alignment uh, on critical issues like Huawei actually helps us weather that, that tactic from China. So I do think this is probably the most compelling reason for why we have to turn Kanzuk from a great concept into a reality. And speaking of the reality, Asia and James, the, um, how would the flow of people look like? Uh, one of the things that we've, we've seen in, in the Brexit debate was concerns over large numbers of uh, people who maybe lived uh, different lifestyles, different cultures from other groups of people, whether the pace of change was uh, acceptable or not to voters. What what's the like realistic like what does an what does a Kansas Union end up looking like to the average end of day uh, the average citizen in each of your states and uh, so we start with the UK first. Sure. So I think you know it's really important that the Conservative Party and indeed every party in the UK pretty much is pro immigration. It's about having the right immigration immigration that bolsters us not just economically um, but also bolsters us in terms of culturally and kind of opportunities for our nation to grow. With Kanzuk, I think a lot of the questions or concerns around migration go out the window because we already have, as Aaron and James have said, these shared values, these shared concepts of the rule of law, our democratic systems are very similar, we share the same sovereign. You know, I believe that I think the most sensible way ahead, given that the UK has set out what we go with a points based system, would it be a specific candidate visa? I think that's probably the most sensible way to go ahead. Um, because obviously, given that we've decided to go with that model, I think free movement doesn't necessarily come naturally to that. Uh, I would be a natural supporter of free movement between Catholic nations, but I think the most sensible and pragmatic and the trans and travel model, but moving it to a kind of specific candidate visa. And James, how do you think in Australia? How do you think Australia, as a political reality, would respond to the idea, like more generally, more, the idea of uh, increasing? Well, there's about a and pan Tasman agreement to also include Canada in the UK. Exactly. I mean, that's the key point, Matt, is that Australia already has this relationship with New Zealand, and it works remarkably well. Uh, Kiwis are an integrated part of Australian life. And in fact, even without this agreement with the UK, there's about a million uh, people of UK descent living in Australia. So I don't think much would change from our point of view. Actually, what would probably happen more easily is young Australians going to London to have that experience that they historically used to have uh, in, the, in the last century, but which has dropped dramatically in the last 20 years as a result of the UK's legitimate desire to control its immigration but its previous inability to restrict it from EU member states, which means its only uh, ability to restrict it has been to non-EU member states like Australia. And I think that's been a really perverse outcome uh, where Australians who are by YouGov polls, the most popular type of migrant and visitor to the UK have been the ones that have suffered the most through EU membership of the UK. So getting out of the EU gives you the opportunity to control those things, control over your trade and control over your immigration. And why not pick other countries like Australia and Canada where there's so much in common, not just language and culture and common understanding, uh, but respect for the rule of law that we know, and similar levels of economic development, that we know that our migrants are going to move freely between each of those four jurisdictions, uh, really without any trouble at all. And also, I just add, Matt, we have to remember that 80% more Brits live in Kansas nations than live in the EU. And that's a stat that people don't talk about. 
and it just makes it so obvious when you say that, that, that Kansas is where British people want to live when they live abroad and so therefore we have to facilitate that and make it easier for them to come to the UK as well. That's certainly true. It's one of those things where we talk about sort of the gravity model of trade, but actually there's a gravity model of immigration as well. They, you, you, move, you, you move where you have family links, where you have your auntie Val live or your cousin lives already. Um, and even if you're from a, a British Indian background, British Caribbean background, a Cantonese background, you're more likely to have family members who live in Australia, New Zealand and Canada than you do with sort of anywhere else that the UK currently has very liberal immigration laws with. Um, in terms of, we, we talk about, you know, in many ways, obviously, you're all from parties of the right. Um, realistically, if this is to become an issue that is settled as a, as a national project for each of the states, it has to be a project that reaches across the aisle. Um, and Erin, in, in, in Canada's case, it also has to be a project that reaches Quebec as well, uh, as a non-English speaking part of Canada. Um, how do we do that? How do we make sure that left-wingers and, and people who aren't from an English speaking background um, are, are appealed to as well? Well, that's a great, great point. I do think there's a unique window uh, right now with, with the governments in Australia and the UK that if we did have a conservative government join uh, the, the club from Canada, so to speak, it would facilitate uh, discussions that I think are really easy once, once there's the political will to make them happen. And within our own country, you know, certainly we, we have the, the French and English and, and uh, um, Quebec traditionally has not had the same level of affinity with, with uh, the monarchy and, and that part of our history. But Quebecers are, are a free trading uh, um, peoples within Canada as well. And I think there's, there is a sense that the more we can have free trade that's aligned with our values and that advances um, Canadian interests broader than just economic interests, I think there, there is that interest. And I'll tell you, the, the cultural ties and connections are so deep that I think the, the, the education and early work years of the young citizens of all of our countries are, are the way to make this work. I, I already think we joke that in, in uh, British Columbia, the Whistler Ski Resort is essentially run by Australians in their, uh, in their <laughs> gap year. Um, we've had some degree of student exchange and student work programs between the countries. But if we could have this mobility and perhaps even having the universities within each of our countries uh, treat Hanzuk members almost like domestic for tuition purposes or have it as a preference over international tuition rates, I think you would see really younger people taking the lead in terms of, of this opportunity to, to ed be educated, to work, to gain that experience, and then potentially learn with those ties and connections. And I think um, Quebecers, people from all parts of Canada, want that opportunity. And this is what I say, when I call it aspirational multilateralism, you're showing benefits that, that flow to the individual person and not just state to state benefits. So I think, I think there would be real interest. I, I think also once the, the, the negotiations or once the, the loose agreement is in place, um, it would be so beneficial that there would be no risk of, in our case, the Liberal Party uh, changing course. I know the Liberal Party in Australia <laughs> is, is a little different than our Liberal Party in Canada, but I don't think you would see a, a change in government leading to lack of interest in Kanzuk. I think that the chances of it being lined up, though, through conservative aligned parties is more realistic. And James, you know, building practical steps, treaties aside, how do we build, I like the idea of the sort of uh, Kanzuk Erasmus that you were sort of mentioning there, and how do we build those civil society links, uh, or rebuild them in many respects after decades of neglect? 
Well, Matt, I was going to make a very similar point to the point that Erin just made, which is that this certainly has been a project largely of the centre-right politically so far, and it has its best chance uh, if we get all Conservative governments elected in, in Canada and New Zealand in their upcoming elections. But it's one of those ideas that once initiated, it would never be reversed. It would be almost impossible to think that a government would campaign on an issue of abolishing Kansas and taking away from people that freedom to travel and to work and to study in these like-minded countries. And that in an age where uh, the world is becoming less stable, not more stable, that you would want to drive a stake between allies and between like-minded countries. One of the most interesting things over the last uh, few months is the way in which the Five Eyes Network has expanded its levels of cooperation. It was previously quite a narrow security-focused organisation, but now the treasurers and finance ministers of the Five Eyes countries and other key ministers have been having their own coordination. And on things like Hong Kong and Xinjiang and other issues with the Chinese Communist Party have been issuing joint statements of concern. Uh, now, that is essentially the political and foreign policy element uh, that's being formed there. The only thing that's missing is the economic element. And I think that's our task, uh, is to secure these agreements and everything else will build upon that. Uh, in a funny way, what the Chinese Communist Party is doing is it's organising the world against it. By its aggressive approach, it is demonstrating to all of us the things that we have in common and the virtues of us working together. And that's particularly important for middle-sized countries, for middle powers, uh, who don't have the weight of a superpower to fall back on. Uh, we need to network closer together in that multilateral way that Erin is talking about to secure all of our own uh, sovereignty and all of our own freedom. So um, this is the time to seize the opportunity. And Alicia, you, uh, this is really your bag. It's a question from Raghav um, and Bill's on what James was just saying. What are your thoughts on semi-uniting some of the, the, you know, the Royal Navy's high command, some of the like port sharing, um, some of the some of the military aspects that allow us to make sure that we're not just becoming a middling power um, on the global stage? And, and have we got like, is there a level to which there could be a formal alliance in the South Pacific between the, you know, Anzac mm -hmm. and the UK? Um, so just before I go on to that, I just want to quickly add, in addition to the points that Aaron James made. The one thing we haven't made is we've made the state for why politicians and people want it, but we have to remember that businesses want Kansas to work as well. Um, all of our businesses want greater mobility for their workforces. Um, you know, the area has trade value something like $3.5 trillion. Um, so I think it's really important to remember that this isn't just a political kind of aspirational piece. This is really important for our businesses for the bottom line, essentially. And it is really important also for defence. I'm not at this point convinced, and Erin and James may disagree with me, that we need a formal defence agreement because the fact is we have the Five Eyes Intelligence. And Five Eyes Intelligence is, is a core kind of, is a core that unites every single piece of work that we do. Even when you're working within bigger kind of political or military alliances, it's still the Five Eyes that come together for separate meetings on the sideline, as Erin was saying. We already share high commands. We have Five Eyes uh, kind of, uh, uh, secondees within pretty much every single major command that we have within our ports. The level of our work together on military cannot be underestimated, but it is also not necessarily that well known publicly. Um, but it is the most important tenant of our national security, without question, is the Five Eyes relationship. And that is why we have to invest in it mercilessly, we have to be proud of it, we have to protect it. And that's why I'm not necessarily open to extending it beyond the Five Eyes at this point in time. Um, but absolutely, Kanzak, we need to, the UK is taking more of an interest in the South Seas for obvious reasons, and that is something that will be welcomed uh, by other Kanzak partners. But it doesn't need a formal alliance or partnership to do that. We are already in the right place, we already have the right mechanisms to support each other. Wonderful. And as we sort of come to an end now, um, I'm just going to hand it back to each of you for 30 seconds or so to give me the one major reason that you think this is a good idea for each of our countries uh, and maybe create a better union uh, for the future of the world as well. So, James, I'm going to head to you first, Alicia, then to you, and then Aaron, finish up with you. Thanks, Matt. It, very briefly, this is an old idea whose time has come. And as every day uh, moves on and as the geopolitical environment becomes less and less certain, its need will become more and more apparent and supporters will pile on. So we can all say that we were here early as the support grows from here. Uh, so this for me is about aspiration, it's about opportunity, it's about affinity, it's about trust and it's about security. And those are five things that all our nations want, all our nations need. 
And Kanzig, as James said, the idea has had its, its time has finally come. So we need to step forward. This is a time of opportunity for the UK. Let's step forward and not make any mistakes and grasp the most important opportunities and affinities before us. And Aaron as well. Over to you. Well, what's interesting, I was reading a few months ago uh, the the Iron Curtain speech from Winston Churchill after he lost the election right after uh, the end of the World, World War II. And in that speech, right after the formation of the United Nations, he warned that if the United Nations started turning into a bit of a Tower of Babel, that it was up to the Anglosphere. It was up to uh, those English-speaking speak, peoples, as he would describe it, to, to step up and be a counterbalance in global affairs. And I think that time is now, uh, as James has, has highlighted so well, the, the need for powers to align, uh, to express our, our shared commitment to the rule of law, to, to human rights, and to a rules-based approach to global trade and other things. I think with the rise of China and, and the failures of the United Nations on, on several levels, it's up to smart multilateralism through like-minded countries. And I can't think of a better grouping of uh, world-leading democracies than Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK to do more together. How formalized that is will really depend on when the parties come together and speak. But I think it's time, and I think the world needs this type of multilateralism uh, of an aspirational quality. Hear, hear. <laughs> yeah, well uh, thank you so much, by the way, for all of you for joining us and for you joining us at home as well. Um, it is a real privilege, actually, to to join. This is, uh, as, as a chair, I've been following this issue for a number of years, and I never thought it would be one of those issues that actually uh, captured the mainstream attention. I always thought it was going to be one of those ones that we always did on the outside, but it's so glad to see it become a, a major issue and a major plank of campaigns right across the world. Um, and as we... I look forward to your campaign, uh, Aaron. I look forward to you taking it, taking the fight to uh, President Trudeau um, and ensuring that you know more Canadians hear about this an idea. And hopefully, um, once the uh, election in, in New Zealand is finished as well, we'll be able to talk to some Kiwis about the idea as well. But um, uh, thank you very much, James. Thank you, Alistia. Thank you, Aaron, for joining us. Um, and yes, winter is coming, but Kanzuk is coming too. Uh, have, a, have a nice day, everybody.